Welcome back. Uh, delighted to have with us today George Cornell. He is a um, author of a very interesting book, and his testimony is fascinating. The book is titled Queer to Christ, My Journey into the Light. And his website is George uh, Cornell. That's C-A-R-N-E-A-L dot com. If you want to go there and check out uh, his website, georgecornell.com. George, good to see you. How are you today? I'm doing fine, Perry. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, thanks for your time. Fascinating story. I don't even know where to begin. Help me. Tell me your story. <laughs> well, I'm a Baptist minister's son, and I grew up uh, in the South and with someone who was struggling with the same-sex attraction and trying to understand where this came from. And I really wrote the book for a couple of reasons. I wanted to give Christians insight into the mindset of what it's like for a child struggling with homosexuality uh, and, and share it through the lens of that child and the foundation that had been laid just because I had gone through a lot of bullying and a disconnect with my male peers. And then because of the demands of my father's ministry and him being gone from the house a lot, uh, I think there was also a disconnect there. And I really share how I moved into the life uh, once I went into a gay bar and why it took me 25 years to get out of that life and to wake up to the lies that are, that are being pushed by the LGBT rights activists and even the Christian liberal theologians. That's a lot right there. Wow. Um, let's unpack that a little bit. Let's go back. Uh, did you have this attraction? How early? I was in first grade and I remember looking at a little blonde haired girl that I was, I thought she was cute, but there was another boy that I really was attracted to. So the feelings were there from very, from very early age. How were you treated when you came to grips with this within the Christian community? That was really a part of the struggle because it was bad enough being ostracized and bullied by the boys and threatened and threatened to slit my throat and all of the stuff that comes with that. But in the Christian community back in the 70s, you know, you would hear a lot of people make very derogatory remarks about homosexuals, faggots, perverts, the queers. Uh, additionally, you would hear about Sodom and Gomorrah and how apparently those two cities were destroyed because of the homosexuals, the sodomites and the perverts. I was so angry because I couldn't understand why I was already found guilty of something that I hadn't done and I, and that I didn't even ask for. And mind you, back then there wasn't the internet, so I didn't have anyone to talk to. No one was talking about it. Celebrities sh sure weren't out and proud about it. So it was a struggle in my head, and I really developed a lot of anger and resentment and even hatred towards Christians. I found that they were more unsafe than my peers. So uh, by the time I walked into a gay bar, and finally got what I had longed for for 18 years, and that was just to connect with someone, uh, to, to feel love or affection, even though at the time I didn't realize that wasn't the type of attention I needed. I was just craving uh, contact, and that's why I became so easily ensnared in that life. Did you get mad at God? Yes, I actually told him I hated him. <laughs> and How'd that go I, and, over? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> it was fine. He didn't strike me down. Um, but I will say one night I was walking into a gay bar in Fort Lauderdale. And as I was walking with some friends, and mind you, I wasn't in church. I hated God. I wanted nothing to do with Christians. God turned the volume of everything down around me. And he asked me, if you were to die tonight, would you go to hell? And it stopped me in my tracks. But I couldn't stop and say to my friends, oh, I think God's talking to me. You know, they would have hauled me off to, <laughs> to a funny farm, I'm sure. But I just ignored God's voice. And within three years of having walked into that life, I was battling drugs and alcohol. Um, I had uh, had a sex addiction and I became a male prostitute and I eventually attempted suicide and it would still be 22 more years before God would get me out of that life. Um, can I ask you a personal question? How was your relationship with your father through all of that? I mean, here he is a Baptist pastor. How'd that go over? We really didn't discuss it until I came out to him and my mom more about 18 or 19. They suspected, and they left a book on a table one night that said gay is not good, and that really ticked me off. I, I was tired of being blamed, ostracized, um, condemned for something that I didn't ask for. And I would say to Christians, the hardest part about this is trying to understand, well, where do these feelings come from? And 
you know, I know Christians look at it from a spiritual perspective, but I'm looking at it as a, I want to love and be loved. All of us do. So that is the challenge because as much as I wanted a relationship with God, I had already been programmed to think that God hates fags. He created AIDS to kill the fags. He's destroyed two cities because of the fags. You're going to hell. And so I had no hope. I didn't think that there was any possibility that God was even uh, could be part of the equation, that I could find uh, any kind of peace or joy in him, or that he was a person who was an ally. Mm. And that's really what delayed my coming out of that life, because praise God that I had Christians who still boldly told me the truth in love. They truly loved me and cared about me. And even though I wasn't really prepared to hear what they were saying, the depression would come because I knew once I walked out of that life, I'm going to lose my network of friends. I'm going to not ever have another date again or feel special to someone. So the inner turmoil was, I want to please God, but yet I want to love and be loved. And they were equally as important to me. It wasn't as if God was a bigger deal than wanting to be loved. Okay, but that was that was kind of like further down the road. When you finally stepped away from your upbringing and you went into the gay bar and you connected, how long did that initial feeling satisfy you until you realized something else was going on here? That's the pitfall of being in that life. You think there's going to be a utopia that you're going to find, and I wasn't finding it. And that's why within three years, I descended as far as, as quickly as I did and attempted suicide. Um, and again, I just removed myself from a church setting and any godly influence because I hated Christians. Okay. Um, at what point did you begin to sense this isn't working? Something's wrong here. It was a process. Um, by I'll tell you where it really started to hit me. In the gay community especially, it's a very youth-oriented culture. And once you start to get older and your looks start to fade and you don't have the hot body anymore— you become less of the meat on the market, so to speak. And wow. so when I would sit in bars and I would see old men sitting there getting drunk and nobody was going to have anything to do with them, it started to dawn on me as I was getting older, this is going to be my destiny if something doesn't change. And that watching them was so depressing to me and my heart really went out to them. I ached for these men and I started to see this is, there is no true utopia in this life. There's no true joy at the end of the rainbow, so to speak. And I started to just ask a lot of questions. I had already started moving into the occult and new age and Hindu teachings, but God was already revealing the holes even in, even in those world religions. And I still couldn't find any peace. Re reincarnation just depressed me to no end. I didn't want to come back and do this life ever again. So I really had to take a look at here is Jesus, who is the one true Savior, who paid it all and did the work for us, and we get eternal salvation and uh, an eternity with Christ. Um, that was appealing to me. But the dilemma was, was I have to go back into a church setting now to hear the Word of God, and I hated Christians because, to me, the church was the lion's den. There was so much anxiety walking into a church. But what God did was, was He started to put good Christians in my life who had the heart of Christ, who would invite me to church. And they didn't beat the dead horse. They truly, they told me how what God's word said, but they still loved me and they treated me with respect and like a human being. And it was because of these people that I was able to change my view on Christians, but also what it did was, was it got me into church. And when you're sitting under a pastor who actually has the guts to tell you the truth of God's word, then you're sitting under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And that really was the beginning of me moving back toward Christ. How did you meet these people? How did they find you? Uh, I found there was a, an advertisement on television for a Bible study, and I wanted to go to it. Something about it appealed to me, and I rarely ever watch TV. And I said to God, if you want me to go to that Bible study, have that air again so I can get the information. And sure enough, a couple of days later, it aired, and I started going to that Bible study, and I was learning— they really kept the Bible study focused on Genesis and tied it in with the rest of God's Word. Mm. And I stuck with that for about two years. I did the, the beginner and then the advanced, and then I went back and did the beginner again just to catch what I missed the first time. I really had a hunger for God's Word, and I enjoyed reading God's Word. But what God started to do was, was He started to help me to see 
to undo the damage of the mean-spirited Christians, and he started to break the toxic foundation of what I had thought about him and started showing me how much he loved me and he really cared about me and that he didn't have an ex to grind with homosexuals. He wasn't homophobic. He wasn't out to get me. What well, his issue was with sin, the sin of heterosexuals and homosexuals. And I started to get the chip off my shoulder, and I could understand God was really coming from the place of a heavenly father who cares about me and wants the best for me. So when he's telling me not to do stuff, it's because he doesn't want me to be in pain. Well, George, first of all, I want to say thank you for your transparency. I am very concerned about this issue and how the church is handling it. And uh, you're helping me and a lot of people with your testimony. One quick question before we take a break. Um, and this is, I, I can't verify this, but it's just some things I've read have been told. Is it true that homosexuals will go through a lot of partners? Oh, I've slept, I'm not bragging. I've probably been with 200 minimum, maybe three, 400 men. Yes. They will say that that is not, ever, I've had some who will attack me and say, well, that's not my life. But what I'm saying is the norm. It's not the exception. All right. So yeah. it's, if that is the case, if I can say this correctly, then your heart's been broken that many times. Yeah, well, at some point, you really have to harden yourself. I was already hardened by the time I went through the bullying in high school and what I went through with Christians. Oh. So there was a part of me that had all, already shut down. Again, I, I, I really put up walls and protected myself. I was cold. I, you couldn't really get to me. I really kept people at arm's length. I've had Christians tell me even when I went back into the church, they say, you know, you're a very nice guy and we like you, but you do keep people at arm's length. It has taken some time for God to break down those walls. Okay. Let me take a quick break. Um, we're talking to George Carnell. You can go to his website, georgecarnell.com. Uh, it's a very resourceful website website and uh, you can check out his book from queer to christ a, my journey into the light uh, he's a frequent speaker at churches and conferences and uh, we have more to talk to him about when we come back all right welcome back and uh what an honor to have with us today, uh, George uh, Carneal. He's the author of a fascinating read, a book entitled From Queer to Christ, My Journey into the Light. Uh, he's a frequent speaker at churches and conferences. His website is George Carneal, C-A-R-N-E-A-L dot com, George Carneal dot com. George, I can, I can just tell right now that we're, we're going to run out of time, and I, uh, I'm really fascinated with your experience and your transparency, and I think we have much to learn here, so hopefully we can have you back. Let's, let's move towards um, the church's response today towards the pressure that the LGBTQ community is putting on the American church. There seems to be relentless here to um, silence the church, if not at least maybe turn the Bible into hate speech. I understand that political agenda, but I'm very concerned about we either are doing nothing to counter that agenda or we overreact in countering that agenda. We don't seem to find the right place. Can you help me here? Yes. I want to make it very clear to Christians. If you are affirming this, a gay, lesbian, transgender individual you think it's the right thing to do, and you may feel I'm coming off Christ-like and I'm so loving and enlightened. You have no idea what the world is like. You have no idea about the transgender lies, about the lies that we've been fed in the gay and lesbian community. If you truly knew what that world was like, you would be horrified that you are pushing individuals into that life. If God was okay with that life, why would he be pulling so many of us out of that life? So, when it comes to those who are affirming it, you're hurting us. And I want to tell the Christians uh, who are bold enough to tell the truth, continue to do what you're doing because God is moving in the LGBT community. I can't tell you the number of people I hear from from around the world who are so miserable. We all want out of that life. A lot of them still want to be in it and, and enjoy the sex, the party and all of that stuff. They just haven't reached the end of their road yet. But it is a death style. It is not a lifestyle. There is a lot of depression 
depression, a lot of drug abuse, alcohol abuse, pornography, uh, sexual promiscuity, not to mention all of the diseases that come with and the number of people that I've seen who've died from murder, drug overdoses, suicide, and AIDS. It is the most unloving thing you could do to support someone going into that. Love them and affirm them, yes. Tell them the truth of God's word, yes, but do not affirm that life. Be a friend to them and help them as they walk out of that life and on that journey. How do we do that so they actually receive it as sincere concern and willingness to help them? Well, with my gay friends, I, I still have a few who do talk to me. They know where I stand on the issue, and I lovingly tell them I don't mistreat my gay friends. I really do love them, and I'm going to stay in their life as long as they want me to because they need some kind of godly influence. Most of them do not have it. So instead of being mean and hateful and, well, if you don't change, I'm not going to have anything to do with you, still ask them, how is your health? How's your job? How's your family? Be a decent human being to them. Invite them to church. You know, some people want to put the cart before the horse and think they have to become a Christian before they go to church. God does not require us to be perfect to attend church. Being there and sitting under the power of the conviction of the Holy Spirit is going to eventually have that person to, to where they make the choice. Am I going to accept this as truth or reject it? But obviously, at the end of the day, we want them to come to know Christ. How do we fight back an agenda that that really is, uh, let's go back to your beginning days. You hated the church and the Christians. Mm -hmm. And the LGBTQ seems to do the same thing. They hate us. Mm -hmm. They want to put us down. They want to shut us up. They want to have the Bible uh, categorized as hate speech. How do we respond to this? This is an all-out mm -hmm. assault. Well, I tell LGBT individuals, you could eradicate Christianity and destroy every Bible on earth, and you could declare hate speech laws all you want. You will still never have any peace in that life because what you are doing is in rebellion and wickedness against God, and you cannot run from the living God. Mm -hmm. So the issue is not Christians. The issue is, is that you are feeling convicted, and either you're going to— Allow yourself to be moved by the Holy Spirit and come to the truth and come to the light and come out of that life and live a life that's pleasing to God, or you're going to harden yourself to the point of where the Holy Spirit will stop striving with you. And then, sadly, it's going to be your fate in an eternity apart from Christ in a place called hell, and hell is real. So that's Romans 1. Romans 1 says, and I'm paraphrasing basically, they see the truth, they know this the truth, they understand it to be the truth, but they decide to reject it, at which point God then goes ahead and turns them over. Is that true? Right. Yes. You know, it was from for me as well. I, again, I, I, get, I hear from so many heartbroken parents who reach out to me because their kids are in the life. But I have to tell you, you really have power in prayer. Prayer is the most powerful thing you can do. And my father and so many Christians diligently stayed prayerful for me. And my father just relinquished me. He said, you're an adult, go into that life. But he prayed that God would allow me to wallow in the pig pen until he brought me back home. And it really was the misery of that life that made me leave that life. In fact, I went out of that life about a year, year and a half before I even gave my life to Christ. That's how miserable I was. So I was ready to leave it. It wasn't working. I've often used the term that people caught up in this lifestyle are broken children. Is that a fair term? Absolutely. That's really where I wish I could uh, ask Christians to be patient, because once I gave my life to Christ and I started to go into counseling, which is why I'm against these people who want to stop us from getting counseling, mm -hmm. you don't have the right to tell me I can't get help and that I must be saddled with these problems or these issues or these feelings. It was the counseling and God working in my life and giving me the healing that I needed because there was some root core issues that were broken. But once I got the healing I needed, that was the strength I needed to be able to walk out out of that life. So these things start with a relationship that seems to be loving, but quickly involves into perverted sex, right? Yes. Uh, it, uh, you will be hard pressed to find long-term relationships in the LG, LGBT community. Even when I would find uh, people who had been together 10, 15, 20, 25 years, they would eventually disclose they have open relationships. And I just got to where I was very cynical about love, but I also was in the world of heterosexuality. Uh, I knew many men and women who were sleeping around on their partners and their husbands and wives, and they weren't even faithful. So to me, everyone was just out there doing their own thing. I really started to become cynical about love. Mm. How did you finally accept Christ's 
love. That was a work in progress, and it wasn't overnight. It has taken me quite a journey to even grasp that God loves me the way he does. And looking at Calvary, when you put Calvary under the microscope and you really look at what Jesus went through and endured, knowing he did that for me and my sin and my wickedness, I don't think there's any other way that you can really understand God's love for all of us until you look at Calvary and what Jesus went through. Is it hard to put all this behind you? No, because I've been out of the life for 13 years, and I'm in a much different place, and I'm so glad to be out of that bondage. It, the difficult part, and what Christians need to understand is, is once I, we walk out of that life, we need a support system. Mm. Christians, you've got to walk with us on this path, because we lose everything. The LGBT community, for the most part, turns on us. They don't want our stories out there. We get the hate, the backlash, the threats. I'm told to kill myself, all of this crazy stuff. We really need you to love on us and pray for us and keep us strong and walk with us on this journey. Um, what would you say to parents, pastors, Christians that just can't get to where you are? They just cannot believe that homosexuals could ever be converted. It is wrong to give up on anyone. As long as we are still breathing, there is hope. God didn't give up on the woman at the well. He clearly addressed the woman who was caught in adultery in her sin. He never mistreated her. He told her the truth and love, told her to go and sin no more. And God was faithful and patient with me. And he's doing it to so many of us. Our stories are out there. I, I find it repulsive that you would want to give up on any individual. If they're in the occult or Satanism, so many people are being delivered from darkness. God has not given us up on us. He is in the saving business and in the deliverance business. George, thank you. You are wonderful. Uh, can we stay connected? I think you have much more to share with us. Yes, I'd be happy to come back if you want. You bet. And where is your book available? Uh, it's on Amazon. You can get it in paperback or uh, Kindle, and it's on um the shop book tab. Also, if you can go to my YouTube channel, there's a lot of interviews that I've done there with ex-lesbians and transgenders. It would help okay. um, rap Christians get some better insight into that world. All right. GeorgeCarneal.com. Thank you, brother. God bless. Thanks for being Thank with us. Thank you for having me.